book of Corinthians, the 12th chapter. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we ever got this thing going? Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols. I don't make sense to us modern day folks, does it? Even as you were led, wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaketh by the Spirit of God, calleth Jesus a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administration, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operation, but it is the same God, which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit of the word of knowledge, to another the word of, I mean the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but all these worketh that one and the self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Praise God. Praise God. Now, <clears throat> we don't too much preach on uh, these power gifts. We don't too much preach on uh, being led in the Spirit like this a whole lot anymore because there's a problem with this. If you're going to preach on this, folks have to be spiritual. Amen. And it's easy to be normal than it is to be spiritual. Hello. Hello. <clears throat> but... When we sit down and analyze that, it is not easier to be normal than it is to be spiritual. It's harder. Because the Bible said the way of the transgressor is hard. So therefore, if we were spiritual, we would be gliding through this world in a lot better position without as much frustration because we would understand what we're doing. Now, I'm going to get on some other things here. Praise God. I was uh, studying for the Bible lesson last Sunday morning, and I ran across this word, and I said, no, I said, oh, I have to use that some other time, and not in the slightest intention or I did that I think I'd use it this morning. And the fact is, I left my dictionary open exactly where it was last week, and I pulled out and started going this direction and never even thought I would ever use this. Amen. But here we are, right back to it again, because evidently God is wanting to talk to me and this church about this. Praise God. Now, I looked up the word psychology. You know, this church is involved in lots of psychology lately because we have to. If you go to court, they're going to make you go to a psychiatrist so they can analyze you and see what they think makes you tick. Boy, they got their problems with us, especially us that's full of the Holy Ghost. They're going to have to do more than they ever dreamed of trying to figure out what makes us tick. Amen. If this thing would come out right, I'd like to send this tape to Jan Long. This Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. And I'm going to tell you... <clears throat> So I was going along here looking at psychology, and man, they would sigh everything in there, sigh, sigh. So I got to look at the psyche, 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 and running all this stuff down, you know, trying to figure all this stuff out. And I found out that psyche, or psyche, is the golden ass of Appaloosa psyche who is a beautiful princess of whom Venus becomes jealous of. And Venus condemns Psychic after a long one. He can, Venus condemns Psychic. I better tell it like it is. I just wrote all this down. You know, so I, 
But Venus condemns Psyche, see, because really Venus is jealous of it. And somehow or another they pour, uh, they drip some hot oil on his shoulder and prove that he's a monster or something, and he has to go off into, into uh, now you guys think all this stuff's funny and a joke and stuff, but this is college. This is college. This is what you kids have got forward, look forward to when you leave our Christian school and go to college. And uh, so they get up there and drip this hot stuff on him, and he turns into a monster, you know. No, they, ain't, they probably ain't got the guts to tell you all this stuff. They don't want you to know the background and the foot and the beginning and the head of everything. Amen. Hallelujah. And I do believe you can go to college and be saved, but I do believe one thing. Before you go to college, you'll have to be saved to come out of it saved. Amen. Because I'll tell you one thing. If you're not really saved and know what's going on when you come out of there, your head's going to be so warped you won't know what. And you won't even care about the Bible no more. Because you got too smart for the Bible. Amen. And when you get too smart for the Bible, you're too smart for your own good. Amen. And well, let's go on with this story, okay? <clears throat> and so, anyhow, because he's supposed to be a monster and everything, he gets sent off into God only knows maybe a million years of hard labor, you know, and, and wanderings and all of this stuff. And when he comes out of it, he is full of wisdom and knowledge and understanding and influence and all this stuff. And so he is raised to be, what's his name, Olympus. Olympus. Maybe that's where the Olympics come from. There he's got. And uh, now he's the great prince of knowledge and of wisdom and of influence. Now, y'all stay with me for a while, okay? Don't just kind of try to grin this off. Some of you grin it off because you think it's stupid. And some of you grin it off because you think I'm stupid. Praise God. <clears throat> so then I go over here and I look after all this stuff and I look at psychology and I find that psychology is a science of the mind. You know, they think us Christians are dingbats and crazy. Can you imagine they think we're dingbats and crazy? Okay. So they, they find out now that this psychology is a science of the mind. Of course, the brain is so big, they never can figure it out. So you would be unbelievably sick. We was driving down the road last night, and this 25-year-old woman calls up this psychologist and asks him if she should let this married man keep on coming in her house and kissing him, kissing her. Hallelujah. Praise God. I mean, people have got to where the... Oh, Lord, help me teach you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. And uh, anyhow... This science of the mind is a systematic knowledge and investigation of those whom this world considers to be geniuses. Have you ever been around a real genius? How many of you, of you folks ever been around a real genius? Well, I have. I was around a boy that had such a high IQ in Salina that his IQ surpassed the general of the base. And he had the highest IQ of anybody on that military base. And he was so smart, he rode a bicycle everywhere he went. A genius is literally dumb and stupid. That's true. A genius is literally dumb and stupid. I consider myself pretty good at games. I've been able to whip 
lots more folks than you shake a stick at playing games. But I sat down with this genius to play some games with him one night, and I never got so frustrated and so mad in all my life. That guy could whip me. It didn't make no difference. No matter what game we played, he could whip me before I could get started. That's one thing that convinced me he was smart. Smart as they said he was. But he wasn't even smart enough. You'd have to tell that boy where the well was so he could get a drink. That's what they call geniuses in this world. Amen. Now, <clears throat> this, they sit down and they, and us people who make the world go around and make a living, they pick our brains. And they pick these geniuses all sit down and, and they investigate all this and they come up and they call it psychology. And this psychology runs into a whole lots of things. This psychology, it runs into analytical psychology, introspective psychology, abnormal psychology, criminal psychology, genetic psychology. And, of course, after I read these, I knew where we was going. It said animal, folk, and race psychology. And what would you expect after that except evolutional psychology? Somebody said, now, Brother Elder, psychology is more important than you think it is. It is so important that after we sit around here and get smart and fine and all that stuff, we find out that our Holy Ghost is dribbling off and we can't figure out what's wrong. Because we're not supposed to lean on brain power. We're supposed to lean on the everlasting arm. If I wanted to be on brain power, I'd start taking me some courses, you know, on how to win friends and influence people. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, this is not anything new. God hates this stuff. He hated it from the very beginning because it takes people away from Him and puts it in themselves. And He hates it. If there's anything I hate in college, it's psychology. And you know what? They love it so much that you can't be nothing anymore without a year or two of it. Amen. Because if they did not make you take psychology, they could not mess you up. There's nothing wrong with math. Amen. And you don't have to have psychology to be a good sign. What's that big high math, Brother Horn? That one you get there at last. Calculus. If you want to be a good scientist, learn calculus. Not psychology, because psychology ain't going to help you a bit to be a good scientist. All it does is inflate your ego. Amen. Makes you think more of yourself than you ought to. Who commits suicide more than psychologists in this state, in this United States? You know why? Because when you're Mr. It, who do you go to for counseling? I'm going to tell you something. I'm glad I can go to God. Hallelujah. Amen. I said, I'm glad I can go to God. There is a power that's higher than the human mind. Praise God. Praise God. Now, if you turn your Bibles open to Acts, the 17th chapter. This is not anything new. God only knows how long ago the 17th chapter of Acts was written. Amen. But it was written probably sometime around 64 A.D. or less. Amen. 
And when we begin to read out of Acts the 17th chapter in the 21st verse, Paul preaching in Athens, and there's no place. You know, there's an old saying, Rome conquered Greece, but in actuality, Greece conquered Rome. And there is no place of psychology and superstition greater than Athens. Praise God. And that's where all this modern day junk comes from anyhow. Now Paul's over there preaching and he said, For all the Athians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. They was there, the geniuses were there picking each other's brains and investigating and coming up with uh, a greater analogy. Hallelujah. And Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're too superstitious. You know, they laugh at us because we talk in tongues. But the biggest joke that I can think of is them running over here to Pit Quick and looking in their little box today, and it says Arius or Gemini or, you know, one of them other stars they was born under, and they pull out their little deal and then roll it and read it and see what's going to happen to them today. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm glad I've got something more than the pickquit to guide me on what's going to happen today. Hallelujah. If that's what you call intelligent, I'm glad I was born stupid. Hallelujah. Praise God. The star that's arose in my heart is greater than any of these stars they claim that they got so much confidence in. And when I go to court, I have to hear the stinking thing all the time called the experts. There are the experts only at one thing. They are experts only at confusing the people and destroying the homes. That's all they're experts at. Amen. Paul said, I passed by and behold your devotions and found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. They worshiped everything, even things they didn't know. But he took that unknown God and began to preach to them Jesus Christ. How many of you are glad we know who the real God is today and from whence cometh the real power and strength hallelujah hallelujah praise God now somebody said well brother Elder, must be pretty old if uh, you go clear back to the book of Acts and find it how about let's go and clear back to its original you see a lot of folks don't know today that Rome all you hear anymore all they had on the religious page last night in the Hutchison News was Catholic Church Catholic Church Catholic Church Catholic Church you'd think there was only one church left and there is and I'll guarantee you it's not the Catholic Church hallelujah praise God now but I'm going to show you where the Catholic Church come from. Over here where I just read to you, it's in Rome and Greece. But now let me get to where it really comes from, where it really started at. How many of you like to get to where it really started at? All right, let's turn to the first chapter of Daniel. You see... If you knew what the head of everything is, God is Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. God doesn't look at things as though they are now. God looks at things as though they were. Where did they start at? Where did this trash come from? Amen. Did it, is it just now happening? No. It is not just now happening. Our earth, our society, our colleges, our people are just recycling back to that day that was many years ago. 
See, Rome was in power, but then Greece was in power, but then the Medes and the Persian were in power, but then Babylon was in power, and Babylon is the beginning. And the government and the system, it don't make no difference who took over. You know, about all the city leaders of this city could die, but they'd raise up the same government. It's in the people. I can't believe I'm looking for Daniel and can't find him. Now, when we look here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which is not their names, were captured. They're three Hebrew boys that were captured from what the world don't believe in today, Judeo-Christian. You know something, a lot of folks say, well, I'm not Judeo-Christian either. What are you then? Well, I'm apostolic. That's great, but where's your background? Where'd the apostolics come from? And these dumb bunch of pagan Christians are preaching the law was done away with. And a whole bunch of people are swallowing it up today and running with it. You know why these pagan Christians want the law done away with? Because they don't want to be governed by Judeo-Christian law. Amen. And so they're not, they're not Judeo-Christians and they really are not because they baptize in the Trinity. And the Catholic Church can become the number one dominant church now because she has now got things to where it don't make no difference them other churches that call themselves uh, Protestant churches are not really Protestant churches, they're her churches. They carry her dogmas, they carry her doctrines, and they carry her baptism. Amen. Now, but there are some, though, that don't swallow that junk. Praise God. And these Jewish boys live according to the laws of Jehovah. I wonder if there's anybody today that's going to live according to the laws of Jehovah. Jehovah is our God. Jehovah is who we will serve. We don't serve a triunity of gods, nor the goddesses of gods and gods and gods and gods. Man, you'd fit in a Mormon church real good if you can serve gods after gods after gods. Because the final end of all of them, they're all a god. Another explanatory reason of psychology. Hallelujah. And here we go. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with the parts of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Aspen as the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes, children of whom there was no blemish but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace do you understand that if you used to go to the presidents you know I, this is the hardest thing for a preacher to do is to learn how to sit amongst the uneducated And enjoy himself and to sit around the prominent and enjoy himself. And you as laity look at us and say, Well, you know, gotta make up his mind which side of the fence he's on. Well, I'll tell you whose side I'm on. I'm on God's side. And the whole truth of the matter is I cannot act in the president's house like I act around here among some of you. Because in the White House, 
to have certain ethics. When I go to a doctor's home, I have to act like I'm in the doctor's home, not like I'm sitting down on your broken down couch. And some of your brains are too small to comprehend all this, so just keep on worshiping God and try to make it to heaven. Amen. But there is times Brother Elder does act different. Act different than you know him to be because I know when I'm at places how I'm supposed to act. And the king did not bring in a bunch of sloppy kids out of the streets of Jerusalem. But when he brought Daniel, Shadrach, and Abednego into his chambers, these were educated boys. These were boys that were trained in the king's house, who knew how to come into the king's chamber. You don't walk into the king's chamber and say, Hey, George, could I have a word with you? You get killed, especially among Oriental kings. You better walk in there right. There's things you have to do, things that has to be said, word that has to be carried to the king before you're even received. And if you go in there before that, you're dead. Somebody said, well, he thinks he's king. He thinks he's king. He is. You find out real quick, he is. In other words, you don't go to the king's house with stupidity. Amen. And so when they got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't get a bunch of clowns. Dumb folks. They had them boys that was ever more trained. But you see, here's the problem. We're not a bunch of dumb idiots either. The difference is, is our training. These boys were trained in the laws of Moses. Amen. They don't train their boys over there in Roman. Did you ever notice our public schools? What do they teach for history? Call it world history. All they teach is Romanism. It's all they teach. They call it world history. Amen. Paganism. And now, in our schools today, along with it, the philosophy of humanism. To back it up, which is worse than it was when I was going to school. And for dads are sitting around here and saying, in the public schools, there's nothing wrong, and all this stuff, and yang, 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 yang. You're kidding yourself and say, well, I mean, I mean. Yeah, but let me tell you something. The bad part about it is you haven't been smart enough to figure out that it's not like it was when you went to school there. Praise God. I tell you what, kids are allowed to do things in the schools today that we'd have got beat for in the school. Amen. Praise God. Now, if you go on and read on with me, and the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of wine which he drank to nourish them three years that at the end there they might stand before the king. Now, among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. These were the real names. Unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar. The name... Of Daniel meant that he was a worshiper of his true God. That's what his name meant. But they gave him the name of Belteshazzar, which means that he was the worshiper of Babylon's God. Kept his name similar. See, the devil won't change it much, just a little. He he don't he don't never change nothing much, just a little. He said to Eve. God said to Eve, in the day you eat, you'll die. And the devil said, in the day you eat, you shall not die. It just changed a little bit.
You see, and then we go on here, but Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king whom hath appointed you meat and your drink for him. Why should he see your faces whom, who's liking that, the children which are of your sort? Then shall you be made in danger my head to the king. Then said Daniel to Melchior, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hanani, Michelle, and Ezra, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee these ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Now, <clears throat> I want you to understand here that fourth verse, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding in science, such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning of the tongue of the Chaldeans. Now, if these Hebrew boys would have went along with this, they'd been dead. Are all you listening to me? I said if these Hebrew boys would have went along with this, they'd been dead. They wouldn't have been in the history book. Because it's not in man's wisdom and in science and in man's knowledge. You say, what do you mean by that, Brother Elder? Because a king's going to have a dream. And all the smart boys can't answer the dream. Well, let's look at it. The king has a dream. In the 10th verse of the second chapter, the Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can shew the king's matter. Therefore there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asks such things of any magician or astrologer or any scientist or any smart aleck that's full of wisdom and knowledge. King, you're asking of the geniuses something that's impossible. But there was a Daniel that prayed to God every day, even though the heathens didn't like to hear him pray. Tried to get him to shut up and quit that praying fix it up so they could put him in a den and shut him up from praying. Thought the lions would eat him, only to find out the lions ate them. Amen. Praise God. Read the 19th verse of the second chapter. Maybe we ought to read the 18th verse first. That they would desire mercies of the God of heaven discerning this secret. That Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of these wise men of Babylon. So you make fun, Brother Elder, of smart people. Yeah, because smart people in the eyes of God are stupid. God said, the man that lifteth himself up, I will abase. The man that humbled himself, he said, I will exalt him. Amen. Say, so you think it's all in Jesus then, don't you? I sure do. I sure do. I think it's in the Holy Ghost, and I think the more the Holy Ghost you've got, the better chance you've got. Amen. Now listen. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are His. That's where it's at. It's not in Olympus, and it's not in Venus, and it's not in the genius of your mind. Hallelujah. It's in the power of Jesus Christ. 
Daniel said, hey, wait a minute. What's this decree so hasty about? Give me a few days of prayer and I'll come back and tell you. I'll come back and tell you. Oh, that just makes them, that just makes them uh, experts mad as all get out. To think that God could do something they couldn't do. Hallelujah. Well, in the second chapter, in the 27th verse, Daniel answered the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king had demanded cannot the wise men the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, shoe unto the king. But he said, There is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and thy vision of thy head upon thy bed are these. And these people using this junk on us are none other than a fulfillment of this verse. Hallelujah. But he said, As for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall be made known to the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thine heart. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold a great image this great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee and the form thereof was terrible. This image head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. And thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the golden broke into pieces together and became like chaff of the summer threshing floor. That's what's going to happen to all these modern day psychiatrists. That's the end. That's the end of them right there. Now, you say, where in the world did you get that, Brother Elder? Out of the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation. Out of the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation. He said, in one hour, Babylon, in one hour, all this stuff that took you all these years to build up these great colleges full of these psychic powers of more turning the people away from God and turning them to Venus and Olympus and Mars and Jupiter and turning them to their own brain power and turning them to thinking that they're greater than God and that all this stuff about the Bible's a myth. Oh yeah, listen to her in the fifth verse. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon. It is a mystery how they can get the people to turn their back on God like they do. Amen. Oh, but he said, I don't see the verse right off hand, but he said in one hour. In one hour. In one hour. Chapter 18, verse 17. For in one hour so great riches has come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the companies in ship and sailors and the trade was sea. And they cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, What city is like unto this great city? Oh my. Rejoice over her, thou heaven and ye holy apostles. <laughs> all I gotta do is stay steadfast. There's a day coming when I know now. I know, I know who I war. You see, we're in a war with two powers today. And we preach to you people all the time on the spirit world. And you think we're funny. You don't even comprehend what we're talking about because you don't pray like you ought to. And when you get back to where we started out at, then you can understand why the Apostle Paul said, Now concerning spiritual gift, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. You know that you were carried, Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols. Now you want me to preach to the modern Pentecostal church? 
You want me to preach to the modern Pentecostal church? You know that you come out of Babylon with a bunch of strange beliefs under these dumb idols. Carried about with every wind of doctrine and of darkness. And you don't liken these spiritual gifts under them. We got people today that's worshiping the stars and the moon and the sun. We got people today that's worshiping uh, the dead and talking to the dead. We got people today that's coming into church and they're worshiping the brain power and psychology and all these things. And Paul simply said, hey, these spiritual gifts are not lacking under these dumb idols. When you go to using the power gifts of God, you don't liken them under things you knew yesterday. Some people try to use the interpretation of dreams and gifts and things like they did yesterday. And all it is is confusion in the house of God. But we need the power gifts in the church. If we had the power gifts in the church and had them being used right, old Corinthian church. Hello? 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 Praise God. How many of you want to use them right? How many of you even want them used in you? Hey, if you had the power gifts being used in you, you could get out of a lot of trouble you get into. The Holy Ghost would tell you not to do certain things and you'd pay attention to it. Daniel could have said, well, you know, when God gave him the interpretation of that dream, he could have said, well, you know, maybe that's not the right dream, Lord. You better give me a few other dreams because I got to have the right one when I go in there. That's brain power. That's psychology. But he knew when God spoke to him because he walked with God. He walked close to God. And he walked in there and he said, Hey, King, wise men can't tell you the answer to this. The smartest men on the face of the earth can't give you this. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth all secrets. I read a beautiful thing this morning while I was studying this here. It said that a man, a pastor in a church in the Malawi Island, were raising money to build their new church. And they had worked for years and years and years and labored to raise $20,000 to build their new church. And right before they got ready to build it, somebody came in and dug up the floor in his house and stole the money. And he set the whole church to fasting and praying. Set the whole church to fasting and praying. Oh, the world wouldn't believe this little story. They'd laugh. They'd say, you think that all oh, the people they tell all kinds of stories like this. <laughs> and anyhow, you can go laugh all you want to if you go look at the new church building. They got busy and started praying and fasting and God showed him in a vision the man that stole the money and that he buried it under a bridge. And several of the men in the church went down to the bridge and dug it up. There it was. Hallelujah. They didn't only know where the money was and had it back. They know who stole it. That's the difference between trying to build a church with a hand saw and trying to build a church with a power saw.
by psychic knowledge, by human wisdom, by understanding, by obeying the Bible, dotting of the I and crossing of the T. And that's the only way you're going to get saved anyhow because he said he's not letting one jot and a tittle slide by. But then we could go to work with the power saw and the power hammers. Hallelujah. Some folks wouldn't need so much pastoral counseling if they prayed in tongues more. I don't feel one bit bad about speaking in tongues. And I'm not going to feel bad about speaking in tongues. Because in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter said, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. You want to talk to God, talk in an unknown tongue. Because heaven and angels understand that language. And all of these clowns that run around with the 14th chapter, hallelujah, and try to prove that tongues are wrong, they don't know nothing about it anyhow, they ought to keep their mouth shut. Anyhow, they ought to read the 39th verse, Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Every preacher in the city that forbids people to speak in tongues is of the devil because the word of God's against them. The word of God told them not to forbid people to speak in tongues and they're directly disobeying the Holy Bible. Amen. Praise God. Now I want you to understand, folks. Brother Matthew was telling me how they got him on a witness stand here a while back and they started on some things. And he said, the Lord just spoke to me and said they want to know some other things so they can prosecute you. And he said, I just turned around and looked at the judge and said, I'm not saying no more without a lawyer. So he shut all that noise off. First of all, it was none of their business because it was stuff pertaining to something that was not even relevant to the case. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, listen. So he said, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaketh by the Spirit of God, calleth Jesus a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. You can't have the revelation of God without the Holy Ghost. And you can't call Jesus Christ a curse when you understand him like you do your dumb idols. First of all, you can't curse Jesus Christ anyhow. All you do is cursing yourself bringing yourself into judgment to him. It's impossible to curse him because he's king of kings and lord of lords, builder of the earth. I like what one man said. He was the carpenter's son. I'm fixing to preach a sermon on how blind the people are. They knew him as the carpenter's son. They did not know he was not the carpenter's son. But he was the carpenter that had created it all. It's terrible when you walk in darkness and blindness. Amen. It's wonderful when you walk in light. And I look at some folks today and I shudder. Because the Bible said if the light in you is darkness. Man, that's a terrible statement. That's a terrible statement right there. If I said no more, that's the most horrible statement. For if the light in you is darkness. How great is the darkness. If the understanding, the knowledge, the wisdom, all that you have in you is nothing but darkness. There are some people I've looked at them and I said I wouldn't waste my time trying to win them to God because I'd have to spend a lifetime 
because the darkness in them is so deep. Amen. 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 And I don't think one person deserves a lifetime of somebody working on them when there's so many people that need to be saved. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. How many of you glad you come when the altar called? Praise God. Now listen, he said. There are differences of administration, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operation, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation to the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. To every man. It didn't say to every preacher. It did not say to every pastor. It did not say to every preacher. It did not say to every Sunday school superintendent. It did not say to every leader in the church or choir member. It said to every man. It said to every man. That's man, woman, and boy and girl. Hallelujah. God don't look on us as male and female. He looks on us as man. And it's given to every man, every man, every man, every man. Some of these dumb churches go around and say a woman ought not to prophesy in church, and yet it's in the Bible. What are they going to do with the? What are they going to do with them in the four maidens that got up and prophesied in the Book of Acts? throw them out of church God put them in church you're going to throw them out that sounds like tradition of men amen I said that sounds like the tradition of men that's what I'm saying these spirits don't operate according to your dumb idols the things you learn somewhere else in another church if you're apostolic, then be genuine apostolic inside of your heart, down inside of your gut, down inside of your feet, to the upside inside of your brain, to the top side of the outside of your head, to the bottom side of the outside of your feet. Don't just be half penny. Some dumb woman got on the radio this morning. You know what she said she was? She said she was a Nazarene Baptocostal. And there was a thunderous applause, squealing and yelling, because she had aligned herself up with many. And she just said, I'm a Christian. And you know what? I looked at my wife and I said, you know what's wrong with her? What's really wrong with her is she is a confused mess. She is a confused mess. And all those people out there are having a blast knowing that she's a confused mess and cheering her on. And she ain't got enough guts to stand up and be anything. She'd rather have the praises of men she would the praises of God I just wonder how many of you are hearing me this morning I'm telling you what I am I'm a one God apostolic tongue talking holy roller born again heaven bound believer been liberated by the name of Jesus Christ hallelujah now let's look at this you want God to help you get down and pray for the one is given by the spirit the word of wisdom to another the word of knowledge another faith we call these first three gifts the power to know supernaturally now we're into something I bet you all went to sleep
11.30. Now we're into some. What are we into, Brother Eller? We're in the spirit world now. And you know what we're dealing with? Your spirit. Can God use my spirit? Or is my spirit filled with egotism? Is my spirit filled with being proud of myself and my accomplishments and of my knowledge and of my brain power? Is my spirit filled with I know some of the psychic things I learned yesterday work and they'll work with God too. Did you know there are some folks among us that are not among us? My goodness, what's wrong with that preacher? Did he lose his marbles? Did you ever read over there in the book of Acts about a wizard which that uh, Philip went down and had quite a revival in this town. And uh, while he was having this revival, a witch found out that his powers were not as great as Philip's. It was it Stephen? No, it was Philip. And so you see, oh yeah, here it is. Philip went down to Samaria, the 8th chapter of Acts. Listen to the 7th verse. Unclean spirits crying out with loud voices came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsy that were lame were healed. There was great joy in the city, but there was a certain man called Simon. He was a witch. Four time in the city, used sorcery, and bewitched the people of Samaria. You know what? He was using his witch power to make a living. That's just the reason why a whole lot of folks in this city wouldn't want to be saved, because if they was, they'd have to get out on the streets and go making a living for themselves instead of the government paying them. And they can't afford for us apostolics to have too much of the right thing because if we did, it put them out of business. And you know what? If we ever in this city get to where we are really giving it to them and whipping them more than they're giving us a fit, and I pray to God in the next year or two it breaks and that's what happens. How many of you believe God that we can believe God that it will happen? How many of you are going to help me pray and fast that it does happen? Hallelujah. Then, if we ever get to that point, then you know what's going to happen? They're going to come out here and try to join the church. You ever hear that old saying, if you can't whip them, then join them? Hallelujah. And here comes the witch in here. You know, saints, you saints need to get to where you have confidence in your leadership. Because that's what God put in here was to guard you. That's what your pastor's in here doing is guarding you. He's keeping the devils away from you. You know, here this dude, now, now Philip, he wasn't, he was... He was just inspired by God and the Holy Ghost. And you know when you're inspired by God and the Holy Ghost, God will use you? But he wasn't one of them that was hand-trained by Jesus Christ, that knew how to discern spirits. But here comes these boys that are hand-trained by Jesus Christ.
Been to three and a half years of Bible school. Real Bible school. The only kind there is. They didn't sit in class and read books. They went out on the street and learned and demonstrated. They were reprimanded in nice ways. One of the best lessons of Bible school you ever find among the 12 apostles is Jesus at the well with a woman in Samaria. Son, it's a lesson and a half teaching them 12 boys what it means to reach the lost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. These boys hand trained by Jesus Christ. And here they come, Acts 8 chapter. Now when the apostles, the 14th verse, were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them two old boys been hand trained, Peter and John. It's always good to have your work investigated by a man that knows God. Don't be afraid to have a man evaluate your work that's a man of God. So what if it isn't 100%? Would you rather it be 40% and built right than 100% and built wrong? Some of us think if it's not 100%, it's failure. No, it isn't failure. We went out yesterday and day before yesterday pheasant hunting. We were not failures, but we sure never even come close to killing 100%. We come home with game in the bag, but not as much as we thought we should have. We came home a lot lighter than we went out. Folks carry four boxes of shells and bring home a box and a half for a box. Hallelujah. But it's not a failure. You know, in this life we've got to learn that it's not a failure when it's not 100%. Hallelujah. How many of you want that in your life so that you're not running around depressed, oppressing, some other kind of press? Huh? Hallelujah. It's not failure. You don't build a house 100% until the plans are 100%. The reason why we do such a good job of it today, we pay somebody to sit over there and burn midnight oil and figure out all the trouble before we start building. But you think that that their architect is not important. You just go out there and start building that house a little bit at a time as you think it up. I remember when I was a kid we was going to build this house, we moved one window. That old lady wanted that one window moved. She didn't like it. And because we moved that one window, we moved one stairways. And because we moved that one stairways, we moved one wall. And because we moved that one wall, I forgot, but we moved a whole bunch of other stuff. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Oh, I'm going to tell you something. I'm glad for the master architect tonight. Now, here he comes down there. But Peter and John, what they do? When they were come down, pray for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was falling upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the blessed Holy Trinity. Huh? No, it didn't say that, did it? It said only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered him money. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Some dudes think they can do anything with their money. But you can't buy this, honey. You can't buy this. Your money perish with you. Hallelujah. And when he stuck that money out there, it didn't take a whole lot of discernment. P 
Peter, he said unto him, Thy money's perish with you, because I was thought that the gift of God might be purchased with money. Now look at this, church. This is the power of God coming in here, talking to the preacher in this situation. You know something? I have had saints that have helped me keep the church. They have waited till everybody's gone and they have come and told me a dream. And said, what do you think it means, Brother Elder? And most of the time, I won't tell you what I think it means. But you don't know that you most of the time give me an answer I've been praying for. Because laity don't need to know what a whole lot of things mean. Praise God. I've had people come up to me many, many times across the district and in the church and say, I was praying and God spoke to me the other day and told me such and such and such. What do you think about it? And I just look at them and I say, I think we better pray real hard. And you ought to pray till God tells you. But they gave me my answer. Let me tell you something. God will expose things. Amen. He'll show you things to come. You better believe. What is it? St. John 13 and 16 or 16 and 13. How be it when he the spirit of truth shall come. He will lead you and guide you into all truth. And he will show you things to come. I think that's in the book of Acts. He'll show you things to come. Hallelujah. What are you into now, Brother Elder? We're not into man's wisdom and knowledge now. We're not into psychic things now. Now we're into God's power and spirit. Him dealing with my spirit. Me bringing myself under subjection to Him. Bringing my spirit into control to His spirit. How many of you just heard what I said? I said bringing my spirit into control to his spirit. When we get up and preach and teach a lot of times, say, you got to obey the man of God. You got to obey the word of God. You got to obey God. You know what we're in actuality saying? You got to get your spirit lined up with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Ye carry us to Kuryanda Mushandala Hasiki Yalaya. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Let's worship Him. Lord's in the house. Do you know what the first three gifts are? They're gifts of revelation. That means God would show you where your kids are and what they're doing. If you pray, Mother, like you ought to, God will give you the gifts of action. That's why everybody wants the gift of faith. Everybody wants the power to heal. Because they're the gift of action, and we all like action. But I'm going to tell you something, a whole lot of us could stop a lot of action if we get some of those gifts of revelation. We wouldn't need so much action. Amen. Hallelujah. I like still waters a whole lot more than I do trouble waters. Praise God. And we're supposed to because the Bible represents us as sheep. And sheep never does drink nor eat around troubled waters. They want to drink at still water. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. We need the gifts. 
And then we need the last three gifts because they're gifts of inspiration. How many of you like to be inspired? I tell you, we need some of these gifts of God going on around here. That way you don't have to walk around and say, I wonder if God's in the house. You can walk out inspired and say, man, do you see how God moved tonight? Man, do you see? Hey! Somebody said you shouldn't use man when you're preaching. Yeah, I know I should I should speak as eloquent as they do at the Episcopal Church. That way I could win and influence people. Praise God. I'm going to tell you something. You might ought to read sometime the book of James. I believe every, every rich person in town needs to be saved and can be saved. But they're going to have to do what that Bible said. That Bible said they got to come down. They're going to have to come down off their high horse and their ivory tower. Amen. That don't mean they have to act dumb, stupid, and ignorant. Because it's ridiculous for somebody that knows how not to act stupid and ignorant to act that way. Amen. That don't mean that. It means they just got to come down off their high horse. Get their spirit lined up with God and the Holy Ghost. They don't have to move into shacks. Amen. Praise God. And for the poor folks that love it because they live in poverty and they like to use that for the other side of the fence, the Bible also says, and you've got to come up so that all are on the same level. It means you've got to quit doing the things you used to do and bragging about the things you used to do and change and be different. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost made me different. The Spirit of God made me different. When I gave my spirit over to God, it made me different. Took cursing out of my mouth. Took that whiskey away from me. Didn't have any desire for cigarettes anymore. I don't sit and watch television and wish that I could sit around and commit adultery with another woman. That's a wiggling around on the screen in front of me. Hallelujah. Amen. Sit there and learn how to rob a bank. Blow a wall apart. I feed my mind better things. Hallelujah. How many of you are glad for what the Lord did for you? And is doing for you. Now we need the power gifts today. Praise God. The power gifts were used at the gate of the fourth chapter of Acts, the gate called Beautiful. Reached over in the book. The man that writes the book of Acts is Luke the physician. And when he writes in the fourth chapter, and he writes, and the man's ankle bones receive strength, that was a phenomenal miracle to a physician who knew that only therapy could take care of that if it could ever been taken care of. But Peter grabs him up by the power of God and he uses the gift of faith and he uses the gift of miracles and grabs him up and said I don't have silver and gold but I have the power of God Jesus Christ that which is in me and grabs him by the hand and said arise in the name of Jesus Christ and the Bible said that the man's ankle bones received strength how quick, fast, I don't know, but they did. Luke, the physician, wrote it that they received strength. He probably heard them popping and cracking in the place. And then the miracle of all miracles, a man who is 40 years old and never has walked one day, went running and leaping into the temple. Now, folks, this is not something, you know, some of us don't get excited about this because, because we've seen people who couldn't walk and then they later on learn to walk again. And that's the problem with our peanut brain. This man's 40 years old. 
Those of you that's 40 years old knows that if you never walked, it would be some more job for some guy to grab you by the hand, some Jesus name, holy roller, apostolic idiot to grab you by the hand and jerk you up and say, walk in the name of Jesus Christ. And he went running and leaping into the temple. That's better than the genius can come up with their psychic mind. What are you talking about, Brother Elder? I'm talking about the power gifts of God this morning. How many of you want revival? I mean an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. I said I mean an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. An outpouring of the Holy Ghost. How many of you want an outpouring of the Holy Ghost? It'll happen if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and pray. I'll be their God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. There is a move of God in this city for us. How many of you believe that? There is a move of God in this city for us. You know what, is, Sister Elena? You know what I thought the other night? I was in Dodge City and a Spanish girl come in there. And uh, she bought something. Pretty little Spanish girl. Went flouncing out. She had long black hair. Well, go out there and look at the girls on the street, the white girls. I thought I looked at that long black hair. That's one thing, preacher, you won't have to argue with when they come in. Better believe it's good. Hallelujah. Some of you that's this bothers me. It really does bother me. A lot of folks are looking for me to roll over and die. Some of you have not figured me out yet. Thank God for a few that's been around here for 18 years that just figured out he won't roll over and die. The bigger the fight, the better I like it. If you ever want to see somebody uncomfortable, just get me in a comfortable position. I can't stand. I can't figure out how folks can love that comfort, that comfort, that comfort, that comfort, that comfort, that comfort, day after day, comfort, hour after hour, comfort. My God, I've enjoyed so much of this comfort, so let me get out and see if I'm still real and a human being. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to say this in closing this morning. We ain't got no high spirit in here, but we do have the truth in here. Old John Paul Jones's boat was shot full of holes. He had blood all over the dead. Men yelling and screaming and crying. Men fighting for their lives. And the other old boy was from the highly trained British Naval School. Looked out and seen poor John Paul suffering. Said, John, I'll take your sword. John looked at him and said, you nut. The battle's not even started yet. We ain't even begun to fight. Don't get your chin up and swell your chest out before the battle's over. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you something. I ain't started fighting yet. This is a hard place to get a fight going. Everybody wants to be so nice, nobody wants to fight. So it's more of a psychological fight. Seeing who can outmaneuver who. It's more like playing chess. But I'll tell you what. I feel angels getting into place. Against demons. Hallelujah. I just wonder how many of you are with me this morning. I said, I feel angels getting into place against demons. Because you see, first of all, this battle's not even ours, but it's the Lord's. Now all you got to do is make up your mind which side you're on. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. So I'm ready to fight. And the best way to fight is with prayer and fasting. And get God stirred up because if I can get God stirred up he can change the channel on the river through Babylon in one hour and a city it couldn't be taken or be destroyed hallelujah yes sir buddy old Belteshazzar was up there making fun of God almighty and taking the things in the house of God and desecrating them and laughing at God and having a time with his lords oh wasn't he having a time when he looked up and seen the handwriting on the wall and the man that knew all secrets that talked to God every day Daniel who walked up again and said God revealeth all secrets and tonight you're going to be with your false gods because your life won't be worth a flip after midnight. 